Let it rip. All right. Just again, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so thank you everyone for inviting me to join your meeting. Uh, as Sarah said, Ed Anderson, uh, I'm uh, about seven years into this hobby. Uh, I've always been interested in astronomy, but about seven years ago, I got really, really interested. Uh, and typically I become, I guess I'm a little on the obsessive compulsive side. So in the seven years, I've gone through nine telescopes. Uh, I belong to a club. Uh, I've written articles for websites uh, and uh, I'm very active out on cloudy nights. I think I have about 25,000 posts. Uh, uh, cloudy nights, yeah, yeah maybe it's 5,000 posts. I don't wanna exaggerate. However, if you find this topic of interest, uh, there is a thread out on cloudy nights uh, and it's the same title as the presentation, Seven Ways to Find Things in the Sky. Uh, that turned into a presentation from my club, which is what I'm uh, going to be presenting here. So I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, can you see it? Yep. All right. And of course, I've got stuff in my way, so I can't get what. So the first thing I'll talk about is uh, my email address here. And I run a observatory, and I'm actually speaking to you tonight from the Custer. We lost your audio again. Yeah, Ed, I think we lost you again. How about now? Here you're now. Yep, you're back. Okay, I don't know what's causing the problem, but we'll struggle through it. Uh, that's my email address on the, on the, this is an image of a card I hand out at, at meetings and such. So what we're gonna talk about is seven ways to find things in the sky. It's tough to find things here. So it occurred to me, you know, why do people buy a telescope and then drop out of the hobby? And first probably is the misset expectations. More costly than they expect, they don't have the time. But I think a big one is that they don't know how to find things. You may go, okay, I saw the moon, I saw Jupiter, I saw Saturn, is that all there is? Uh, oh yeah, you can see galaxies and yeah, how do I find them? So the goal of the discussion is to is really a matter of awareness because in speaking with people, I've discovered that some of these are new to people, they don't know about them and uh, others are gonna take time. The advantages and the challenges of each method. It's not a statement about which is better, they all work. Some require more sky knowledge than others. Some require more equipment than others. Some are more sensitive to light pollution. Some take you right to a target and others you travel a path. Only you can decide which will work best for you. So I've broken these up into three basically groups, uh, visual, computer assisted and setting circles. So in, in the visual category, I refer to these as eyes alone. In other words, I can look up and I can see it. The moon, Jupiter, Saturn, um, certain other bright uh, deep sky objects. But these are things that you can see. No moon. If uh, after my eye, my sky is very bright. Up there that I can see with the binoculars. Um, to aid in you in doing visual targeting, uh, obviously we also have optical finders. 
that can see more than we can see with our eyes and are very similar to binoculars and low power wide view eyepieces. I mean, my personal uh, strategy on eyepieces is the first eyepiece I get for any time. Low power widest view, something that will max out your field of view. Why? Because it makes it easier to find things. Oops. So uh, point and view targets are the things like, again, the moon for example, I can see it, I can identify it, I can locate it. Uh, if you're in a very light polluted area, sun, moon, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, the Orion Nebula, a few others can still be seen visually. And so you can use that to target red dot finders all you really need. In dark areas, you can see a lot more, but you're still fairly limited compared to what's actually up there. Now, along with uh, the use of finders, if we use charts and such, we uh, go to a method called star hopping, which I consider to be part of the visual method because you're using your eyes and what you can see. You're using turn by turn directions for those of us who remember the old uh, triptychs or, uh, you know, the. Uh, guidebooks where you'd look up the map number and you look up the chart number and then you look for somebody's street and you start figuring out how to get there. You have a starting destination uh, and you plot a course. You'll identify markers along the way. If you're in a car, you're at street signs. If it's in the sky, then you're looking for you know, this little arc of stars maybe, uh, this uh, little collection of things over here, things I might recognize in the eyepiece. And we're gonna give examples of these. Uh, if you can, you determine the distance you have to go. Again, thinking back to those days of using the Hagstrom maps. Uh, this method works well with binoculars. I do all of my star hops with binoculars first. Because if I can't see them in my binoculars, I'm not going to be able to see them in my optical finder. Uh, method is very affected by light pollution, but it does encourage discovery along the way. There. And along the way, I spot a diner that I think I might want to come back and look at. Well, I'm going to look for this cluster. And on the way to the cluster, I find this really interesting group of stars that I wasn't even looking for. So one of the benefits of star hopping is that you do tend to find things along the way. All right. Now, if you're working with paper charts, can uh, some, somebody give me a thumbs up here? Can you see my cursor? Can you see it move? OK, good. So uh, one of the things that you can do if you're working with paper charts is you can make up uh, what I call uh, degree circles. Uh, I have uh, several paper charts. I don't use paper charts much, but I do have several. And what I have is wire circles made up. One is 5.5 uh, degrees, which matches the uh, field of view of my 8x50 finder. Uh, the other one is about 1.75 degrees, which matches the low power wide view of my 12 inch dot. So I can slide these over the paper chart, put them where I think I'm gonna be. And I go, okay, within that field of view, what am I looking for? What am I gonna see? What are these signposts? What are these uh, little arc of stars here? This three over here, okay. If I'm looking for M103, well, how do I know where it is and how do I know I found it? So I'm gonna start from Rukba. I'm gonna look for this little three of arch and then M103 should be over here, right? Here's an example of using star hopping. Uh, I used the uh, Stellarium to set this up. The thing that I'm looking for is in this blue square. Cannot see visually, probably uh, cannot see it in my optical finder. So I will identify Capella as my starting point, where if we were in the car, this would be home. And these circles on here are projected Telrad circles. So this is a half degree wide, this is two degrees wide, this is four degrees wide. So start a Capella, put it on the outer edge of my field of view of my Telrad. Four degrees over is this second fairly bright star. Maybe I can't see it with my eyes, but I should be able to see it in the optical finder or my eyepiece. Now I'll move over and center that and my star cluster should be right here. This is star hopping. 
And again, I just keep going back to turn by turn directions of the car. I go here, I'm looking for the street sign, I make a left and there I am. Works very well, does not work well at my house. Uh, in, even in my optical finder, I can see almost nothing in my, sub, in my southern sky. And in my western sky, I see nothing. You know, Capella, it will stand by itself in a blank sky. Um, so I needed to find other methods in order to be able to find my targets. Now, if you do uh, use star hopping, uh, these are the tools of star hopping, red dot finder. Tell rad. Um, I, I have a red dot finder on some of my scopes. I have a tell rad on another. And I use the tell rad in combination with an optical finder. So on my 12 inch job, I have one of these and I have one of these. I have a right angle, uh, uh, what do you call it? Eight by, eight by 50. The binoculars have a very similar field of view to this optical finder. And then, of course, there's the low power wide view eyepiece. So some objects are visible. You can see them with your eyes. Um, you can uh, see them with binoculars and you can use binoculars to help you with your uh, testing out your star hops. Apps on the phone can help you confirm bright stars. This is one of the things I teach new people. I said, okay, these apps that you get on the phone, you know, where you can hold your phone up to the sky, they're not accurate enough to, to target your scope, but they're accurate enough to confirm that I think that's Capella. Yep, use that app. Yep, that's Capella. Okay, so that's my starting spot. I know how to how to go from there. Um, you're going to have to learn how to use charts or, or apps in order to lay out. Your map. Uh, often benefits from a combination of a zero mag like a red dot and a multiplier. But you are likely to build a better understanding of the sky than people who are using the other methods that I'm going to talk about. The second group I want to touch on is computer assisted. And uh, you'll see that I'm going to break this down into uh, push to go to and plate solving. So based on computerization in the mount, you know, we talk about computerized telescopes, but really what we're talking about is computerized mounts. Um, there's really three types that are available on the market today. A push two that's based on encoders. Push twos do not have motors. Basically, some sort of computerized system tells you where to push the scope. I, I use it the hot and cold method. You're getting warm, you're getting cold. Um, the go to uh, work basically the same way. They have encoders that read the position of the scope. Uh, I'm sorry, read the position of the mount, but these are motorized. Uh, then the last is plate solving based on cameras, which may be used to drive a push to or a go to scope. And we're going to give examples later. So you, with these, once you've, and the, the key here, of course, is that you have to align that mount. And this is where a lot of new people get completely frustrated because they say, why doesn't the computer know where I am? Why doesn't the computer know where it's sitting? Well, you have to pick a couple of stars and you have to get the thing aligned so the computer so the computer knows, okay, now I know where I am. I can find anything you want. Once you get it aligned, these things can be very accurate. My first scope was a, a Mead ETX-80. And I bought that because I, after talking to people on cloudy nights, I realized I have a terrible light pollution problem. Star hopping is going to be a problem. I wanted to make sure I could find things. So even in my horrible conditions, that little ETX-80 found tons of things for me. Wasn't a lot of aperture, but I gave up aperture for computer and I'm glad I did. And it was pretty accurate. It would hit targets all the time. Now the encoder based systems, again, there are sensors on the shafts that read the position of the gears. So the, the scope does not see anything. It's all based upon you doing an alignment and then uh, it's counting rotations of gears to figure out where the scope is pointed. These, on the other hand, are based upon plate solving. These scopes actually read the sky. Uh, this one, uh, which Celestron came out with last year, this is the Star Sense Explorer. Now, if any of you have uh, set, uh, yeah, Celestron, 
Next Star Systems, they sell a StarSense uh, device for it, which is camera based, which helps you to align the go to. But that's all it does. Once the go-to is aligned, it's using the encoders to figure out where the scope is and where to point. This system has no encoders. You put your phone on the mount, it's, there's a mirror here, it actually takes a picture of the sky, compares that picture to its database, and now it knows where it's pointing. You pick things off the screen and it comes up. This is one of the scopes that I recommend to new people all the time, about 400 bucks. And it uses the phone as your guidance system and it works great. Uh, Unistellar, this is a completely computerized go-to system, but it doesn't work on encoders. It does the same thing as this one does. It's mm -hmm. taking pictures of the sky. This is actually a completely automated astrophotography system. It cost about $4,000, turn it in, plug it in, turn it on, it figures out where it's pointing out in the sky. You tell it what you want to see, it'll point at it, it'll take the picture, do the astrophotography for you. But the key here is that it is using plate solving to direct the, uh, the mount. So in order to uh, use these go to push to systems, you need a computerized mount. Uh, Go to and push to typically require some sort of initial setup. And this is where people get in trouble with these things because they don't follow the directions. They don't do what they're supposed to do and they don't do it in the right order. The scope isn't aligned and they can't find things. But once aligned, once aligned the systems can uh, be pretty accurate. And then the plate solvings uh, can be either used to automate the, the go to system setup or to actually guide the scope. Down, downside of these computerized mounts, go to push to plate solve, is um, they do cost more, but prices are dropping. Uh, you need to be comfortable working with computers. You need to be able to follow instructions to the letter. They require very little knowledge of the sky. Um, they shift your time, especially when you're new, from hunting to observing. Some computerized mounts are locked to the computer. Uh, so you cannot use them without the computer. Uh, this, the Nexstar SE series, for example, really can't be practically used without the computer. Other computerized mounts have clutches. You can release them. You can swing the scope manually. Some of them will even stay aligned when you, move, when you swing the scope manually if you want to do that. Once alignment is mastered, things are quick and easy to find. And then, of course, you have the uh, plate solver with their self-aligned. And then here's just some examples. Uh, I've owned an Orion and telescope Dob. This is a push to. I loved it. Worked great. Uh, Orion Star Seeker, Celestron, Mead Auto Star. I have two of these that I own, and a third one that I operate here at the Custer Observatory, uh, a, an LX200, and so on down the line. The last uh, approach, the last method that we're going to take a look at is setting circles. And this is the one that actually triggered that whole presentation. And there's another thread out there where I do a whole discussion on these setting circles. So these use coordinate systems to identify a location, not a target. In other words, by using these setting circles, I'm going to point my scope at a certain spot that I think that this device, this item is in. Um, there's two types of setting circles. One is alt altitude azimuth, alt as. The other one is right ascension and declination. Um, so we'll start, let's start with alt as. This is the um, coordinate system that we think in and that we work in every day. Uh, if you're in the Boy Scouts and you ever used a compass, okay, you were learning about azimuth. So in our local sky, the sky appears as a dome. Point on that with two coordinate points. Zenith is straight up. The celestial horizon is 90 degrees down from the zenith, basically uh, what we refer to as the horizon. Azimuth are coordinates around the horizon, zero to three to 60 degrees, similar to a compass. 
Azimuth is measured from Polaris, not magnetic north. This is a key point. Again, when I've shown people how to do this, they go and take their compass out, they point it north, they align everything on north, and they can't find anything. Now, so you have magnetic north versus celestial north is different. In New York, magnetic north is 13 degrees away from celestial north. Polaris defines celestial north, that's zero. All right, and in New York, uh, the magnetic north is 13 degrees to the left of that. Angle gauges, this was actually the, the first tool that I used when I started to learn how to use this Altaz method. This is uh, in the center here, these are carpenter's tools. People, uh, carpenters put these on a table saw. So if your table saw is level and you wanna cut a 45 degree angle, you, you take one of these magnetic devices, stick it on the saw blade and you read the angle. Well, you, you put this on the tube of a daub or any uh, optical tube and it'll read the angle of that tube. You can, there's apps for your phone to do it. Uh, there's also uh, people have set these up on their mounts. All right, so like this and like this. Now, the difference between these two, this uh, degree circle is reading the angle of the mount. If that mount is not level, these will not be accurate. These devices read the angle of the tube. So even if my mount is not level, this reading of the tube is absolute. So I might, my, my mount could be three, four degrees off level, wouldn't matter because this isn't reading the, the angle of the mount, this is reading the angle of the tube. I have, these are actually mine, uh, sitting on one of my dobs and I also own this one up in the right hand corner. That's what I use for my altitudes. To do azimuth on, on scopes, uh, again, most of us uh, are familiar with using the compass, so you can think of it in the same terms. Um, these two on the right, this was my Orion X-T8. This was my first time trying to put a, an azimuth circle on a scope. I found a site where I could print out a 360-degree circle, the same size as the plate of my uh, daub. And I just cut, printed it out on nine sheets, taped them together, cut it out and taped them onto the base. Above here is my Apertura AD12. And on this one, I paste, I, I cut the, uh, I'm sorry, I made the uh, azimuth circle. It goes on the bottom plate and I cut a notch out of the top plate and that's my marker. Okay, so on the XT8, you can see I've got that little red, red tape there with a line on it, that's my marker. Over here on the left is an Altaz uh, mount. And I went to Amazon and I bought two of these uh, six inch, 360 degree um, circles, cut the center out of one, took the mount apart, glued it down onto the tripod, put the mount back together. The zero is sitting, on, is sitting right along one of these legs. So when I go out to start observing at night, I, I, put the scope, I put the thing on zero, put that leg toward Polaris and I adjust the mount until I'm looking at Polaris through the eyepiece when it's on zero. Now I can find anything in the sky. Same thing with these two. I go set my mount up toward Polaris with the zero showing. I put the optical tube on and then I just jiggle the base of the daub a little bit left, a little bit right until when I'm looking at Polaris, this is showing zero. It's not it's simpler than doing a, a polar uh, alignment on it. Once I have these set, I can find anything in the sky. And I've signed, found Uranus, Neptune, uh, you know, distant clusters, all kinds of things. By the way, I don't have the chat session up. So if you're sending me messages in chat, I'm not seeing them. Now, the one trigger on these uh, alt as method of finding things is that alt as coordinates change continuously. So until we had computerized sources for these things, this really wasn't that most practical way to do things, but we do today. We have phone apps, Stellarium, there's a whole pile of different apps on that you can have on your phone, on your computer. And if this was live, these numbers would be changing constantly. 
So I have my phone. I actually have my phone on a wristband. I'll decide what I want to go look at. I click on the information. I get the alt as. I go set the azimuth. Rotate to the azimuth. Set the angle gauge. There it is. Usually I get within a quarter to a half a degree of it being in the center of my field of view. So it's a system that most people find familiar. Again, altitude, azimuth, these are things that we, we know about. These are our personal coordinates. Uh, it works like a camera tripod, works with any mount. Coordinates change constantly, so I have to have a, uh, something that will give me near real time uh, coordinates. Uh, I do need some tools to be able to direct them out. In this case, an azimuth circle and an angle gauge. Most alt, most alt as mounts don't incorporate setting circles, so you have to add them. Uh, and just a note that paper star charts are not in alt as coordinates. So I've had people come back to me and say, Where are the, you know, I can't translate this star chart into the out as well, that's because they're not in that coordinate system. <clears throat> now, some of you will laugh. You say, oh, geez, everybody knows that. Well, guess what? Everybody doesn't know that. I can't tell you how many times when I got started, people have said to me, everybody knows blah, blah, blah. And I looked at them, well, I don't know it. And therefore, everybody doesn't know it. And if you get to know me, you'll know I'm somewhat of a you know, A type. My best way of learning things is to ask questions. Now, what's wrong with this coordinate system? It tries to describe the motion of the sky in our reference frame. Motion appears to be in arcs that rise and fall. But what if we could conform ourselves to the motion of the sky? You know, take that coordinate system and sort of tip it so that it matches the way the sky moves. Well, I'm, I'm in New York. My, uh, I'm at the 40th degree of uh, latitude. So if I sat down in a lounge chair and set the back of the chair at 40 degrees, laid my head down with my binoculars, okay, I would be aligned with the coordinate system of the, of the sky and the earth rather than what I look at when I'm standing. And when we tip the coordinate system over like that, what we come up with is the equatorial system. This is the system of astronomy. This is a system that aligns the equator of the Earth with uh, the rotation of the sky based upon the position of the sun at the March equinox. The right ascension scale reflects how objects rise and move across the sky over a 24 hour period. So right ascension is measured in units of hours, minutes, and seconds, units of time. Declination gives the position above and below the celestial equator. So we think of that as horizon. We've tipped the horizon, in my case, 40 degrees. And so uh, right ascension is how far have I ascended above that? coordinates of the selected uh, object to observe. So not terribly different from what we did with alt as, but we're just reading in a different coordinate system. And it is important to note that modern star maps are all almost exclusively laid out in the equatorial system of right ascension and declination. Now, when we talk about right ascension declination, we're almost always See, here's the, here's the alignment of the scope. Here's the alignment of the Earth. The scope is set up to align with the Earth. As you track something across the sky, you only have to track in this one um, axis. When you are tracking things in alt as, you have to track in two axis because they go up and over and up and over. It's a step function. Here, we track smoothly in one, one axis. 
Now you can take an equatorial mount, many of them, and turn them into, uh, I'm sorry, Altaz mounts and turn them into equatorial mounts, or at least equatorially align them, I should say. So one of my scopes is an ETX-125. This is directly out of the ETX-125 manual. It comes on a mount that has a tip table. So if I tip that table up 40 degrees, what was my azimuth axis is now my right ascension axis. And if this were to track something during the night, instead of going up, over, up, over, up, over, it would only translate, it would track things only by rotating to the right. There wouldn't be any up motion. And this is the preferred uh, axis and the preferred um, coordinate system to be used for astrophotography because we only have to track in one coordinate, in one axis. And so we can track more accurately and more smoothly. Uh, if you own something like, say, a, a Celestron Nexstar uh, 6SE, 8SE, Celestron makes a wedge that you can put on the mount that will allow you to realign that to your, uh, you know, your latitude so that you can align that scope uh, in an equatorial fashion. So here's a, an example of how we might find something using equatorial um, Altaz coordinates. So if we're looking on our chart and we uh, start from a star that is sim at a similar declination as the object we want to see, in this case, we're looking for this star cluster. We want to look at Deneb, it's so about the same altitude. So we can set the scope on Deneb, right ascension 41 minutes, declination 45 degrees 16. This one's at 21, 45, 16. So if I get Deneb in, in the, uh, in the uh, field of view of the scope and I move the right ascension setting circle from 20, 41 to 21, 10, I'll be on the cluster. Another method we can use when we're using right ascension declination and uh, again, typically an equatorial mount is the drift method. So again, this is the cluster I'm looking for. I'm using Deneb as my reference. So I set the scope up on Deneb and I let it sit there for 29 minutes. And in 29 minutes, this cluster will have drifted into my field of view. So using setting circles to identify an object. Uh, you find something that looks interesting, but don't know its name or its designation. And compare them to an app or a star chart to see what's at that position. So this is actually doing it the other way around. I found something, I don't know what it is. Let me take its settings and translate those back to an app or to a chart. And now I know what I'm looking at. So benefits of uh, right ascension declination is that specifically not designed for astronomy, requires polar alignment, star chart grids are set up in this coordinate system, equatorial mounts are, are optimized for this. And as we said, Altaz, many Altaz mounts can be set up for this. It's not affected by light pollution. However, most people are not familiar with this right ascension declination coordinate system and find it very confusing. I know I did. It took me quite a while before I actually grasped what this whole, what is this 23 hours, six minutes? What kind of coordinate is that? You know, couldn't, could not for the light. I've got a chart, I've got a, uh, you know, one of these whole sky charts up on my wall and I can read the right ascension and declination off the chart. And like for the life of me, could not understand what the heck this thing was describing. Uh, what I discovered as I went through that conversation that led to you guys being stuck with hearing me tonight is that uh, this right ascension declination setting circle method of finding things it seems to have fallen out of fashion. Uh, I can't find anybody in my club who still uses this to go find things in the sky. Some of them use Altaz, a lot of them star hop, a lot of them using go-to scopes. I couldn't find any, and some of these guys, you know, yeah, 30 years ago, this was the only way to find things. 
But today, nobody seems to use this method anymore, but it is a valid method. So now we've gone through the, all the seven methods. Now, if you get to the right spot, can you recognize what you're looking for? This was me three months after I bought my ETX80. really wanted to see was the Andromeda galaxy. I mean, I was pumped up for this. And I'm reading my charts and I'm looking at Stellarium and it says it should be right there. And I, I got my scope aligned and I go look. And this is what I'm expecting to see. And this is what I saw. And where's the Andromeda galaxy? And I told people it can't be seen from my house. So, oh, wow, that's really amazing that you can't see it. You can't see it. Then I got an eight inch dob. Still looking for this. What I found was something like this. Ah, oh, that's not what I bought the scope for. So I learned to sort of better level set my expectations as to what I was gonna see versus what I thought I was gonna see. And if you go back to this first slide, I said one of, one of the reasons that people drop out of astronomy is because of the wrong expectations. Look at those pretty magazines taken by that billion dollar scope that's flying in space that image that object for a week. And how come it doesn't look like that in my $300 80 millimeter refractor? Oh my God, these people lied to me. That's not what it looked like on the box. When I finally got to Cherry Springs, Pennsylvania, which is a Bortel II site, using my 12 inch daub, this is somewhat what it looked like. It actually didn't look quite this good. This is a sketch, this is not a photograph. But I was never gonna see this in my 80 millimeter, and certainly not at a Bortel A site at home. So now I have a much better understanding of what I'm gonna see when I see it. The bolded items on here, these are the methods that I have personally used and that I can use any of these pretty much at will. Um, I'm really interested in this plate solving method. Some people are buying the Celestron star sensor. They buy the uh, cheap one, the 80 millimeter, it's 180 bucks. They rip the mount off it, throw the scope in the garbage, bolt it onto their dobs. And of course, you, part of the what you're paying for is the license for the app and uh, never use the scope they bought it on. Uh, and from what I hear, this thing works really well. It's, what, it's the one that I recommend to a lot of new people. So which ones do you know? Which ones do you like to use? Altaz is currently my primary method for finding things. I have a go-to scope. I've used push to. Uh, I've done star hopping, of course, we've all done naked eye. But uh, unless I can see it in the sky, this is the method that I use most of the time. So the goal of the discussion was to create awareness that there were a variety of methods, highlight advantages and challenges of each. It's not a statement about which is better. They all work. Some require more sky knowledge. Some require more equipment. Some are more sensitive to light pollution. Some take you right to the target and others may travel a path. Only you can decide which ones are the ones that are best for you. So that's the end of my talk. I'm gonna stop sharing and I have a few minutes to, uh, I have about 20 minutes I can take questions, comments or whatever. Well, great, Ed. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, pretty great. I really enjoyed it. Um, if you would like to ask some questions, you'll have to please unmute yourself, or you could uh, type it into the chat, and we'll get that to Ed. Yeah. Right. John, John's uh, hey, waving his hand. Go ahead, John. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, I got a quick question. While you're talking there on, on the other computer, right right behind my iPad here, uh, you know, I got up here the website there for the observatory. Uh, of all those scopes you have listed there, what, what's, what's in the dome? Uh, right now we have a. Is that the ten-inch refractor? Yeah, it's the ten-inch refractor. Ten it's actually refractor. a ten-inch. Yeah, it's a ten-inch. Actually, I think it's a folded refractor. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah. which is which is a okay. bitch to a which is a bitch to a line. Yeah. <laughs> we used to have a uh, I think it's a twenty inch uh, Newtonian in there, uh, but uh, we traded it out for the ten inch optical uh, ten inch refractor. And okay. that's called Custer Observatory. Yeah, this is the Custer Institute and Observatory. If you know Long Island or you know the map of Long Island, we're on the North Fork, uh, which is the north, which is the top of the fishtail. Um, and uh, we're in a town of Southhold. Uh -huh. So a lot of people know of Southampton, which is on the South Fork. If you go straight north from Southampton, you get the North Fork and you get Southhold. That's where we are. I, li I live about an hour and 20 minutes from here. Mm -hmm. and that's Ed, where Ed, go ahead yeah. john sorry oh and that was that was pretty good your explanation on all those different ways of, of locating stuff and that and you know like 50 years ago when i started this stuff yeah i did the old star hopping thing you know breaking your neck and everything trying to find stuff and everything <laughs> and then as i graduated along you know currently on my 15 inch obsession i have sky commander along with a servo cat mm -hmm. and that, i mean that facilitates for you know seeing more stuff in, in an evening than he would normally but uh every once in a while just recently where i had a malfunction on that i had to go back to the old days but i knew the sky well enough you know and it was easy to find things yep. in the old with the charts yeah i don't get along very well with paper charts i have a tremendous problem translating a flat paper chart to a dome yeah uh, i've sat out in the uh i, I again i started with a go-to scope and I am ex extremely happy that I did. And I would never push anybody away from it as long as they get along well with computers. Yeah. But you got to follow the instructions in the sequence they give to you and you can't skip steps. Right. <laughs> yep. And they'll do what you tell them to do. But if you don't tell them the right thing to do, they'll tell them what you tell them to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, and, and the other problem I have is I don't remember things in their position in the sky. I have the same problem in the car. I mean, I, if you, yeah, I, customer observatory, I've been out here a gazillion times. I still put the GPS on before I leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> so, because for some reason, I used to frustrate the hell out of my dad. Uh, I just don't remember how to get places. Uh, this has nothing to do with Alzheimer's or, or aging or anything like this. I was this way at, at 18. So, uh, so for me, star hopping and memorizing where things were just doesn't work. So, yeah. Any other questions, comments, well, I... complaints? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty interesting. I, I enjoyed all the techniques that you were using there. Uh, and uh, yeah. I, I myself start out with a go-to scope. And after a few years in, I was sitting next to somebody who had just a push scope, no, no uh, push to earning just visually moving it and i was intrigued by how he was finding things and so i bought one of those a dob just to learn the sky better and actually it is a lot of fun trying to find things it takes a lot longer sometimes especially dim objects but uh it, in a light polluted sky it, there's nothing like a go-to scope <laughs> yeah right <laughs> well, well it's funny because my own progression and and again if you you have to get the context of how people like myself, you know, when I do a presentation or gee, how did you come upon all these things or whatever is my first scope was that ETX 80. It's a full, that's a full robotic go-to. My second scope was an Orion XT8 and telescope. So now this is a push to same concept, but you have to push it and you have to track. But the beauty of the push to scope is there's no motors and there's no gears and you don't have to use the computer. So that was where I started my star hopping. And it had a nice optical finder and I put a Telrad on it and really discovered that this was not for me. But it was also where I did my first experimentation with the alt azimuth. Because I could put that azimuth circle on the base and I could put that angle gauge on, which magnetically attached to the tube. And my goodness, this really works great. And holy crap. And so I started telling people about it. Um, and uh, those were, you know, so there was a progression of what I learned and what I used and how I came to understand how each one worked. And uh, so that's, that's been, you know, my education there. And I just picked up my first equatorial mount. 
only because, and I have no intention of getting into astrophotography at this time. Uh, I just want to learn how to use an equatorial mount. Yeah. Is it is it computerized? No, it's a, it's a, it's an old. Um, the guy I got from was a member of the club. I, he was a, a Mead a DS something, a DS10, I think it was. So it was yeah. a 10 inch Sona to uh, a Newtonian on this massive equatorial mount. Oh yeah. And now yeah. I don't I don't have the tube. I just have the mount. So now I have to figure out how to adapt it to my refractor. For the you know I've got a four, a four inch, 102 millimeter ED refractor that I want to use on it. So I got to take that big strap mount and base off it, and try to put some kind of a dovetail on it so that I can use it with my refractor. My sole purpose for taking this taking them out was so I could learn how to use an equatorial mount. No other reason. Well, my first scope when I was 13 had an equatorial mount on it, and I was able to learn it back then, a really long time ago. Um, so you should have an easy time at it, I think. Yeah, I, I've had kind of a bad attitude about equatorial mounts because uh, most of the ones that I've had uh, interface with have been things like power seekers. You know, low end, wobbly, little tiny setting <laughs> circles, an yeah. enormous amount of play. And every one that I've used has been one that's been sitting in somebody's living room for five to 10 years because they bought it and they couldn't figure out how to use it. And you know what I did with it? I showed them how to swing it over and make it work out that <laughs> And they were like, wow, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. And not a single newbie that I'd ever worked with had had success with uh, these cheap equatorial mounts. So I've, I, I've recommended away from them, but now I need to learn how to do it. My first, awesome. uh, my first computerized mount was an LXD 55. I think it was built around the, around 2000 or so. And I, when I got it, it was, it was just 11 years old, but it worked perfectly. It was dead on all the time with the, uh, auto star four, four twenty seven. I think it was And Kelly. Now he, he has it now, but it never has, failed me. Has anybody tried one of these new star sense explorers? Nope. Uh, guys, guys, you got to find somebody who got one of these things. Actually, I, actually, I, the club has one, but we haven't gotten it out because we went into the COVID. Yeah. No, oh, well, I I was talking to a guy the other day uh, who's, who has one of these. He's got the 102 refractor, and he pulled it out for his niece's 16th birthday party and because they had it at his house. And so it went into the evening, and he pulled it out, set it up, put the phone on it, let it find its position, and the kids took it away from him and used it for the next three hours. And not one of them had ever used a telescope before. Oh my gosh. Wow. And they were finding stuff all over the sky. And this Aren't is in light polluted, lo light polluted Long Island. Yeah, Paul, maybe we, we should just keep it. Yeah. If you yep. don't want it, if, if you guys don't want it, I, I, I have an that. address. You no, know, yeah. we we got locked down right after just a month after we received it. We we received it in January or February, I think, of 2020, and um, we were going to put it in an auction. Then we got closed down. Uh, I, I, bid, there. I, I bid. I bid a dollar. <laughs> a dollar. <Yeah. laughs> Mark and Paul ought to go out there and pull it out and use it. I, I am very tempted yeah, to go well. buy the the cheap one. Uh, the the 180 uh, millimeter refractor. I am telling you, gentlemen, this is the future. I really had my doubts about it, though. You know, but well, maybe we should. You know, I don't take know. those doubts, throw them away. Maybe this we'll end works. up. Uh, maybe we'll end up keeping it. Yeah. This thing absolutely works. Yeah. I, I have yet to talk to an owner who didn't love it. And as a, and, and and I'll reiterate, you know, at, at the risk of repeating myself, I'll reiterate, there are a lot of big scope users yeah. who are buying these things and throwing the scope away just to get the uh, the mirrored mount and the license for the application. You go out on cloudy nights and you you do a search on Star Sense Explorer, and you may you may be looking at a 25 inch dob <laughs> that's got the Star Sense Explorer bracket and uh, mount sitting on the side of it. So, uh, 
On that note, I thank you very much for allowing me to address your club. I need to move to um, the next uh, presentation. So thanks very much. And, uh, you know, if you want, uh, I can join you again sometime. Thanks, okay. Ed. Yep. Thank good you very job. much. That was good interesting. Job. Really yeah, good. Very good. That was very good. All right. All right. All right. I'll stop recording now. Anyway, Mark, that is a 